Mr. President, I rise today in support of the 2012 National Defense Authorization Act, the critical piece of legislation that we're now working on that will strengthen our national security, provide for our troops and their families, and improve oversight of American taxpayer dollars. Over the last half century, the Senate has successfully passed a defense authorization bill without fail every year. This strong tradition of bipartisanship continues today under the joint leadership of Senators Levin and McCain. As a member of the Armed Services Committee, I want to thank the chairman and ranking member, as well as the majority and minority staff, for their dedicated and tireless effort as we work to bring this important legislation to the floor. Throughout this year-long process, our committee takes on extremely difficult and contentious security issues. And at times, we have our differences. However, we take on these disagreements in a respectful and open-minded fashion, driven by a strong commitment to cooperation and compromise. Bipartisanship has never been easy, but it works as the Armed Services Committee has proven year in and year out. I hope that all of our committees in the Senate can work in this kind of cooperative fashion, especially these days when budget constraints are so difficult. No department of the federal government is immune from the severe fiscal challenges facing our nation. That includes our Department of Defense. We're cutting $27 billion from the President's budget request in this bill, nearly $43 billion from the last year's authorization. We need to find ways to maximize our investments in defense by aggressively eliminating unneeded and underperforming programs. And we need to streamline our business practices and invest strategically in future technologies. The bill before us helps ensure that our troops, especially the 96,000 serving in Afghanistan, as well as their families, continue to receive the care and support they deserve. It provides hard-earned pay raises for all uniformed military personnel, funding for critical equipment, and training required for our men and women to succeed on the battlefield. The Defense Authorization Bill before us makes important investments in defense science and technology. And Mr. President, as I know you agree, we need to do more to prepare the next generation of scientists and engineers who will be so important to maintaining our nation's superior technological edge. The current bill makes a small down payment on this important effort, and I intend to continue to fight for more investment as we move forward. The bill also includes a number of provisions that will enable the Defense Department to lead in the creation of a more secure energy future for our military and for our country. As the single largest consumer of energy in the world today, the U.S. military has taken some initial steps on energy efficiency, energy mitigation. Senate will be in order. Senator from New Hampshire. And the use of renewable and clean energy alternatives. But we still have a very long way to go. I look forward to continuing to work with the Department of Defense to take advantage of more energy savings opportunities in the future. This year's defense authorization bill also includes significant resources to fight non-traditional threats, including the proliferation of nuclear, chemical, and biological weapons, and the growing challenge posed by cyber warfare. In addition, I'm pleased that a number of provisions I've been working on are currently included in the bill. First, we're extending the Small Business Innovation Research Program for the next eight years. This is critical to keep our defense manufacturing base and our small business innovators strong and competitive. This is a provision that I've worked on, and um, I want to commend Senators Landrieu and Snow for their leadership in the Small Business Committee for working on this effort and for working so hard to get this extension, a long-term extension, into the Defense Authorization Bill. <laughs> The bill also includes a version of the National Guard Citizen Soldier Support Act, which will go far in providing our National Guard members with the unique services and support they need when they return home from the fight. We also have a Navy shipyard modernization provision that's been introduced by Senators Snow and Collins and Senator Ayotte and I from New Hampshire. 
It also includes a $400 million cut to an unnecessary and underperforming weapons program that I've worked closely with Senators McCain and Begich to include. In addition, I was pleased to co-sponsor Senator Leahy's National Guard Empowerment Act, which gives a stronger voice to our 450,000 citizen soldiers in our National Guard. Now, though we have a good bill before us, I believe it could be better, and I've introduced several additional amendments, two of which are designed to provide the nearly 214,000 women serving in our armed forces with the reproductive health care they are currently denied under the law. Unfortunately, we were not able to get a vote on these amendments, but I hope to continue to work closely with the chairman and ranking member to address these important concerns. In addition, I've worked closely with Senators Collins and Casey on an amendment to address unsecured and looted stockpiles of tens of thousands of shoulder fire missiles in Libya. If these weapons fall into the wrong hands, they pose a serious threat to civil aviation worldwide and to our deployed forces abroad. I want to thank the committee for including this provision in the legislation. I also want to address briefly some of the concerns that have been raised with respect to the detainee provisions in the bill. The underlying legislation which I supported is an attempt to provide a statutory basis for dealing with detained members of al-Qaeda and its terrorist affiliates. In committee, we made some difficult choices on this extremely complex issue, but we did that in order to strike a bipartisan agreement to both protect our values and our security. I understand, like all of the members of this body, the concerns that have been raised on both sides of these issues. As a general principle, I believe our national security officials should have the flexibility needed to deal with a constantly evolving threat. But I also believe that clear, transparent rules of procedure are a bedrock legal principle of our constitutional system. I believe the military detention language in this bill includes a significant amount of flexibility for the executive branch, including a national security waiver and broad authorities on implementation. Though I support the goals of the chairman and ranking members underlying legislation, I also believe we can improve those provisions. And I supported Senator Feinstein's amendment that we just voted on, which would require, which would restrict required military custody to only those terrorist suspects captured abroad. I hope, Mr. President, that despite the disagreements, we will continue to chart a bipartisan path forward with respect to these detainee provisions in the years ahead. We need to give our national security officials at home and abroad a clearly defined but yet flexible system which protects our constitutional rights and our national security. In conclusion, I believe the 2012 Defense Authorization Bill before us will strengthen our national security, maintain our military power, keep our defense businesses competitive, help cancel and roll back wasteful spending, and support the men and women who defend our nation every day. I hope the full Senate will quickly come to an agreement on the pending amendments and pass this important piece of legislation so it can go to the President's desk as soon as possible. Thank you very much, Mr. President.